Hi, I'm Dan with Family White TV, and this is part two of Home Theater for the Masses. So in part one, I talked about projectors, so it only makes sense now that I talk about the thread count on your throw pillows. So now it only makes sense that I talk about projector screens. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is DIY versus commercial. Since this is home theater for the masses, uh, trying to keep it affordable and easy to get in for a lot of people. So I'll talk about the DIY aspect first. Because the question is, do you need to spend as much on your screen as you do on your projector? For example, the guy at the uh, boutique projector store might tell you, if you're going to spend $5,000 on a projector, you need to spend at least $5,000 on your projector screen to do it justice. Well, I don't think that's true, and I think you can easily get a really nice projector, and you don't have to pair it with a $3,000, $5,000, whatever commercial projector screen in order to get a good picture out of your projector. So DIY will save you money, and I'm going to get into more specifics about that as we go through the various aspects of uh, screens. But I think the most important question you should ask yourself is, do you have kids, or do you have pets? And if you do have kids, are they old enough to realize that they should not color on your $3,000 projector screen with Sharpies? So if you don't have to worry about your screen getting ruined by pets or kids or something like that, then a commercial screen might be something that you might want to aim for. And you don't have to spend $3,000. They start at a few hundred dollars and they go up from there. DIY screens, though, you can get a pretty darn good screen for, I'd say, starting at about $100 when you include the uh, materials and the actual screen. So I'll talk a little bit more about specifics of DIY screens and materials, but first I want to go through all the various basics that we need to uh, know about when we're looking at home theater screens. So some of the main things we'll be talking about is screen size, whether or not it's acoustically transparent, we're going to talk about screen gain, we're going to talk about its aspect ratio, also the physical types of screens, ambient light rejection, and some other things here and there. So let's talk about what you would expect from the ideal projector screen. The ideal projector screen is going to be a screen that is going to disappear behind the picture that's being projected on it. When you have a picture being projected on the screen, you don't want to notice any sort of texture on the screen. You don't want to notice any sort of sparklies. You, don't want to, you just don't want to see the screen material at all. The ideal screen is going to be smooth. It's not going to have texture to it that's going to show up on your image. Now, a lot of materials might not be perfectly smooth, but that really depends on how far away you're sitting from your screen as to whether or not you can see any of the texture that is on the screen. Also, the perfect screen is going to be uniform. You're not going to notice a difference in the picture as you look across the screen. You're not going to notice weird oddities on the screen or maybe differences in gain or things like that. You're, it's just going to be a nice smooth picture and you're not going to notice any differences in texture or anything. And also the ideal screen is going to be neutral. And what I mean by neutral is it doesn't affect the color in any way. You want a screen where if you project a white image onto it and your projector is calibrated to project a white image, you want the image you see to be white. You don't want it to be slightly red. You don't want it to be slightly green or slightly blue. Ideally, a screen is not going to affect the color balance of the image in any way, but it's just going to project, but it's just going to reflect the image back as your projector puts it out. So that's what the ideal screen would be. Now we'll talk about what everyone mainly thinks about when they think about a home theater screen, and that is its size. That's why we get a home theater to begin with. We want that big, huge, impactful theater-like image. And so we want a big screen. If we wanted a smaller screen, you'd get a 65-inch television, but a theater screen is about having a huge screen. So there's going to be three things that are going to affect the size screen that you're going to be able to have. First, of course, is your room size. I mean, obviously, you're not going to have a bigger screen than your room's going to allow for. And also, indirectly, your room size is going to play an effect in how big a screen you have in terms of how big of an image the projector you have can project. If you already have a projector, you're going to want to use a projector calculator like this one at projectorcentral.com, which will show you how big of an image your projector can project given a given distance. So if your room isn't large enough, there's some projectors where you might be limited by the largest image that that projector can project. If you haven't purchased a projector yet, then what you're first going to want to determine is what your ideal screen size is going to be. Once you know how big of a screen you need to project onto, then you can help narrow down some of the projectors that you might be looking at. Another factor in screen size is the projector's brightness. Now this isn't as much of an issue today because there's a lot of nice bright projectors out there. But if you're going for an image that is like a lot bigger, like 
I'm not talking 100 inches or 120 inches. I'm talking if you if you have room to where you can have a 150 inch screen or or something even larger than that, then the projector's brightness is going to play a role in that. And so again, you're going to want to look at reviews and how much brightness the projector can put out and make sure that the projector you're looking at is going to be able to illuminate the size screen you want. If you can't afford a projector that's going to be able to illuminate a 160 inch screen, then you're probably going to want to consider getting something a little smaller. Now in relation to screen size, there's also your ideal viewing distance. And really, I'm going to say that's up to personal preference. Now we could say that THX recommends a viewing distance of 1.5 screen widths, which is 26 degrees field of view and no more than 36 degrees and or something like that, but really it depends on what you want out of your home theater. Now for my screen, which is 10 feet wide, the THX recommendation is that I send, sit 15 feet back, but I know I'm sitting closer than that. I'm sitting about one screen width away. The only consideration is if you're watching a 1080p projector, the closer you get to the screen, the more likely you are to see the pixel structure. If you move up to a 4K projector, then you'll be able to sit closer to the screen before you can notice the pixel structure. So really, how far you sit away from the screen is up to personal preference. THX recommends 1.5 screen widths, but really it's up to you. A lot of people like to sit one screen width away. And that's and there's nothing wrong with that. It's your theater. You sit as far away from the screen as you want. And the final thing which can affect the size screen that you have is going to be your speaker placement. Now for this we're going to get into acoustically transparent screens because normally if you get a regular projector screen that is just a, a flat solid screen you will have your speakers placed to the sides and you're going to have a center channel underneath it. Now you might be tempted to get as big a screen as you can and just have this the speakers right on the sides like right up against the wall but the thing that you want to be careful about is speakers aren't going to perform as well acoustically if they are right next to a wall a lot of times speakers like to be at least around 12 inches away from a wall so so if you do have a speaker right up against a wall you're going to be compromising the speaker's ability to give you good quality sound also with a lot of floor standing speakers they need to be up away from the wall a little bit in order for the because uh, usually they have base tubes coming out the back. So the speaker's base performance is gonna be also affected by how close it is to the wall. So that's something to consider if you're going to go with a standard projector screen. An acoustically transparent screen is a screen designed to have speakers placed behind the screen. And the screen is not going to have a huge impact on audio performance. Now the screen is going to attenuate the sound a little bit. You just have to turn up the volume a little bit but ideally an acoustically transparent screen is going to affect a speaker the same way all across the audio spectrum. So whereas with a solid screen, if you put that in front of a speaker, not much sound is gonna be able to get through it, it's gonna sound muffled. But whereas if you get an acoustically transparent screen, then the audio is going to be able to get through there. Now the advantages of the acoustically transparent screen is it gives you the ability to have the biggest screen size you possibly can have for the room that you're in. Another advantage of acoustically transparent screens is you can have your center channel in the middle of the screen behind it. Whereas with a solid screen, you would have your center channel below the screen. Now, depending on how far back you sit from the screen and how much you pay attention, you're going to notice that the dialogue won't be coming from the screen, but will be coming from the speaker beneath the screen. That can be distracting for some, so ideally you'd want to have the center channel speaker directly behind the screen so that the dialogue comes from the screen, not from below the screen. Now some of the disadvantages of acoustically transparent screens is it will have a little bit of a dimmer image than a solid screen. Also because of the way acoustically transparent screens are, some of them are perforated with small holes, some of them are woven, you might be able to notice the weave of the screen if you sit close enough to the screen. So those are things you're going to want to consider. Mainly, how far away from the screen are you going to sit and are you going to be able to see that texture or not? And a lot of screen companies are good about sending you little samples in the mail so that you can put a sample and you can sit at your normal viewing distance and you can look at it really closely and inspect it and just analyze the heck out of it and decide whether or not you're going to be able to notice the uh, screen material or the texture of the screen and whether or not it's going, it's going to bother you. Now I mentioned that an acoustically transparent screen can be a little bit dimmer and that brings us to the next specification for home theater screens and that is screen gain. How bright a screen is going to appear is going to be determined by its gain. 
A screen with a gain of one is what's called a unity gain screen. Basically, a screen with a gain of one is just like projecting in a white wall or a white piece of paper. It's not going to be any brighter or dimmer, but it's just going to have a uniform gain or brightness. Now, before getting into more specifics of gain, let's talk about what unity gain is. Unity gain is when a projector projects light at the screen, the light reflected off the screen is going to be reflected off equally in all directions. That means that a screen with a gain of one is going to have a very wide viewing angle. So if you have people who are going to be sitting way off to the sides, the screen will appear just as bright to them as it does to people in the center. Now the disadvantage of a unity gain screen is it has a very poor ambient light rejecting performance. So this is the kind of screen you'd want to have in a home theater where you have complete control over the light level in the room. If you're going to have a room that's going to have ambient light, say maybe during the daytime, sun's going to be coming through the windows and you can't control it, then the unity gain screen is not going to be ideal unless you're fine just using your home theater at night. But if you do want to have some light in the room, you might want to consider a screen with a little bit of gain. Now there's a huge range of gain that you can have, but a lot of projector screen manufacturers will put out screens with a gain of 1.3, which is a little bit of a gain, but it's not too much. What gain is, is a screen that has positive gain is going to tend to reflect light back in the direction that it was struck. So as, a as the light from the projector comes towards the screen, the screen is going to tend to reflect the light back towards the projector. Now a screen with a low gain of say 1.3 is still going to reflect light off to the sides, but it's going to reflect more light back towards the viewing position. So a screen with a gain of 1.3 is going to appear a little bit brighter than a unity gain screen, but one thing you have to consider is off-axis viewing, which is basically if you're sitting towards the side of the screen, it's going to appear a little bit dimmer than if you're sitting in the center of the screen. Now there are screens that have even higher gain of say 1.8 or daylight makes a high power screen, which has a gain of over two. Now with a high gain screen, it's going to tend to want to reflect more light back towards the projector and viewing position than it is off towards the sides. So a high gain screen is going to appear significantly dimmer in off axis viewing than it is to someone who's viewing the screen straight on. So this could be a consideration if you have a room with a really wide seating area. There's also something called hot spotting. What hot spotting is, an extreme example of hot spotting is if you've ever seen a projector projected onto a whiteboard, whiteboards tend to be shiny and smooth, you're going to see that there's a really bright spot right in the center. Well, that's an extreme example of a hot spot. Screens with gain can also exhibit a hot spotting to some extent. A really high gain screen, even if you're sitting in the center, you're going to notice that the center of the screen looks a little bit brighter than the edges of the screen. If you tend to move to the side of the viewing area, you're going to notice that one half of the screen is going to appear a little bit brighter than the other half. So that can become distracting as you move up in screen gain. A screen with a gain of 1.3 is still is going to have a little bit of this issue, but it's not going to be nearly as noticeable as if you do get a screen with a really high gain. So what kind of gain are you going to want for your application? And it's, and it's going to depend. If you want to have a nice darked out theater room where you're going to have nice dark walls, you have complete light control, then a unity gain screen is going to be just fine. And that's good because unity gain screens tend to be a little bit less expensive than screens that have higher gain. What you'd want a higher gain screen for is if you're going to be viewing in a room that has ambient light in it. A higher gain screen is going to reflect a brighter picture to the viewing area. And so you'll be able to see an image that is still nice and bright even with some amount of ambient light within the room. Now there are also some screens that have negative gain, which would be a gain of less than one. So it might have a gain of 0.9 or 0.8. That means it's gonna reflect a little bit less light back than is coming towards it. Now there are also gray screens on the market and the purpose of the gray screens is to maintain black level any room that has a little bit of ambient light. Now there are gray screens with positive gain and there are also gray screens with negative gain. When you might want a gray screen with negative gain is if you have a screen in a theater room where you're unable to uh, make the walls and ceiling a nice dark color. What's going to happen in a room that has uh, the standard white walls and white ceiling is the light from the projector is going to reflect off the screen and then it's going to reflect off the walls and some of that ambient light that's reflected off the walls is going to get back to the screen and it's going to wash it out a little bit. 
What a gray screen will do is it'll help maintain the black level of the projector while also still projecting a nice satisfying white level so that the screen still appears bright. Now in cases where you have a room that has uh, windows that can't be blacked out or, or where you can't control the light in the room, there are screens that are called ambient light rejecting screens. What these screens are designed to do is it takes the light from the projector and it reflects it back usually with a fairly high gain. But also what it does is it takes light that strikes a projector screen from the side and it absorbs that light without reflecting it back out towards the viewer. In this way you can have a projector screen in a room that does have ambient light and you can still have a very good picture coming from the screen. Now the caveat of such a screen is again that it's going to have a uh, fairly narrow field of view so if you're sitting off to the side you're going to notice the screen's not as bright as if you were sitting in the center of the screen. And another consideration for ambient light rejecting screens is if you have a short throw projector. The screen is going to want to tend to reflect the light back at the same direction it came from. So if you're sitting far back and your projector is overhead and it's a ways back in the room, that's not going to be as big of an issue. But if you have a short throw projector where the projector is closer to the screen than the seating area, then you're probably going to have issues with the ambient light rejecting screen unless you get an ambient light rejecting screen that is specifically designed for short throw projectors. Now the first ambient light rejecting screen was the Black Diamond screen by Screen Innovations. This was one of the, the first big breakthroughs in ambient light rejecting screens. The drawback of their screen though is that, well, number one, it tends to be very expensive, like thousands of dollars or more expensive. And also the screens tend to have a, uh, a limitation on how big they can be before there's a lot of howitz spotting. Now I think I did see on their website that they are that they do make larger screens now, so maybe they've overcome that issue. But that's something that you're going to want to research and make sure is uh, resolved before you uh, go ahead and spend that much money on a screen. Now another feature of the screen is the finish that it has, and there's two main types of finish. Uh, the one type of finish is a matte finish, which is it's basically a smooth, it's not shiny, it's just a nice smooth finish. And usually unity gain screens or maybe screens with a little bit of gain are going to be matte screens. Now screens that have high gain are going to have a screen where you, a surface where when you get up close to it, it's going to kind of look a little bit shimmery or sparkly. And that's, that's basically the materials inside the screen that are designed to reflect the light back towards you. With these screens, you're going to want to make sure that you're sitting back far enough that you're not going to see that, that pattern because it can show up if you're sitting close enough to it. Also, these screens can have what's called sparklies, which is when you're sitting at your standard viewing area, there might be one part of the screen where there's like a little fleck of something in it that just reflects the light right back to you and it kind of like appears as a, as a star in the screen almost. Now there's easy ways to correct for that. One thing I've heard is uh, you just sit, if you notice one of those, you just take a little pencil and while keeping your eye on where the sparkly is, you just kind of dab it with a pencil and that takes care of it. So it's not something that's a huge deal, but those screens can have sparklies in different areas. I mean, depending on where your viewing position is, but generally it's not too huge of a deal. Now the next thing to consider is the screen's aspect ratio. And what the aspect ratio is, is the ratio of how wide the screen is to how high it is. Now way back when, in the early days of motion pictures, uh, movies were made in what is called the Academy Aspect Ratio, which is 1.33 to 1. Uh, movies like The Wizard of Oz was filmed in this ratio. And the Academy Aspect Ratio is also the aspect ratio which was on old televisions before high definition televisions came out. Now probably 99.9% .9 of home theater applications, you're not going to have a screen that's going to be 1.33 to 1 because all the home theater projectors today are in the 16 by 9 format. Now maybe if you're like a old movie buff or something like that and you just don't like any of the new crap they make these days and you just like to watch the old movies, then you might want a screen that's in the Academy aspect ratio. But most of you are going to want a screen that's going to be 16 by 9 or larger. So 16 by 9 is the standard high definition television format and it's also the standard format for ultra high definition or 4K. Pretty much if you go into a Best Buy or Walmart or wherever and you look at the televisions, the, all those televisions are going to be in a 16 by 9 format. Now if you go into a higher end store you might see some televisions that are in a different format, maybe a 2.35 or 2.41 format, but most 
regular televisions are going to be in that 16 by 9 format. It's probably very rare that you're going to see anything that's not 16 by 9. Now the next major aspect ratio that you should be aware of is the 2.35 to 1 aspect ratio, or also some screens are made in 2.4 to 1. This is the widescreen aspect ratio. This is the aspect ratio that a lot of the epic movies are filmed in. Uh, all the way back from uh, Ben-Hur was one of the earliest ones. Uh, more recently, Lord of the Rings, uh, Star Wars is filmed in 2.35 to 1. Uh, a lot of the major epic movies are filmed in 2.35 to 1. Now, there are also a lot of movies that are, for that are filmed in the 16 by 9 format. Which brings the question, all right, which screen size do you want? 16 by 9 or 2.35 to 1? Can you have one and still have the other? Well, let's talk about kind of the uh, reasons for that you might want to have each. Now, if you want the no fuss, just set it and forget it home theater, then you want a 16 by 9 screen because the panel resolution of your projector is going to be in 16 by 9. And so basically you're going to project an image onto the screen and it's going to fill up the entire screen. Now, if you watch a movie like Lord of the Rings or Star Wars or something in the wide screen, what you're going to see is black bars on the top and bottom of the image. Now, there are features within the projectors that will stretch the image to get rid of those black bars, but that's <laughs> basically what you're doing when you stretch the image to get rid of those black bars is you're, is you're distorting the geometry of the image so that people are going to appear taller and skinnier than they really are. So if you don't want to have the black bars on the screen, there's two things you can do. Some people opt for electronic masking systems where they'll have a black piece of material or fabric or something that'll come down and it'll frame the image so that you just have the screen in the middle and you don't have the black bars on top and bottom. Now, the big drawback for this is that your movies that are supposed to be more epic in scale appear smaller than regular broadcast television. And that just doesn't really make sense. So is there something that you can do in order to make sure that the movies that are supposed to be epic in scale re retain their, their visual impact while still being able to display your 16 by 9 images? And the answer to that is yes, you can get a 2.35 to 1 screen. Now this screen requires a little bit more conscientiousness on your part. What this kind of screen is called is a constant image height screen, which means that you're not going to have black bars on the top and the bottom. The top and the bottom of the picture is always going to be at the top and the bottom of the physical screen. The difference is when you display a 16 by 9 image like standard television or some uh, movies that aren't quite epic like romantic comedies, things like that, you're going to have the black pillar bars on the side. So what you can do is, like what I've done, is I have masking is I have masking blocks that I can put on the sides of the screen in order to still have that nice frame and to have and to not have the uh, pillar boxes on the side. It creates a nice frame for the screen. What you do when you watch a widescreen movie is there's a couple options. One is you can use the zoom on your projector to zoom the image out, and then you're going to have to adjust the uh, the height of the projector and the focus of the projector. Now, if you go with a constant image height setup, they do have projectors that have what's called lens memory. If you've watched the video on projectors, I've mentioned that, but just really briefly, there are some higher end projectors where if you have a constant image height setup, you can set your projector for a 16 by 9 image, you program that into a lens memory, and then you adjust your projector to have a full, to fill up a screen for a 2.35 to 1 image, and then you save that as a lens memory. And that way, when you watch a movie that has a different aspect ratio, you just have to press a button on your remote control and the projector adjusts itself automatically and you don't have to do anything other than press a button. Now, if you want to get a little bit more high end in a setup like this, you can get electronic masking systems. I'm not as high end, so I just have to manually put the uh, sides up, but you can get electronic masking systems like curtains, it'll close up a little bit. Like if you, if you go to a regular movie theater, you're gonna notice a lot of times that when the movie comes on, maybe the curtains open up a little bit to accommodate the wide screen, or maybe it's a movie that doesn't have that wide screen aspect, so the curtains close down a little bit to frame the picture. You can do the same thing at home, either with motorized curtains, or you can have some sort of motorized masking system. I mean, it's really limited by your uh, DIY ability or how much you want to spend on a professional installation. Now, if you're using Zoom to fill a 2.35 to 1 screen, 
there is a drawback to that, and that is that you're not using your projector panel's full resolution. Your projector, since it's zoomed out, is going to be projecting black bars above and below the screen, and those black bars are essentially wasted. Well, there is a way to be able to use those black bars and still fill a 2.35 to 1 screen, and that is by using an anamorphic lens. However, this gets a little bit beyond home theater for the masses because these lenses tend to be expensive. There's a company called Panamorph that makes lenses for regular projectors, and it's priced at $4,000. Now, they recently released a new lens that is designed for native 4K projectors, and that lens costs $9,000. <laughs> what these lenses do is they work with your projector to use your projector's full panel resolution. What your projector does is it stretches the 2.35 to 1 image to use the full 16 by 9 panel. And then what the lens does is it will stretch that image out so that you have a geometrically correct 2.35 to 1 image that fills your entire screen and also uses your projector's full panel resolution. So the advantage of using a lens like this is that you get a little bit more resolution out of your projector and also you get more brightness out of your projector. Now, the AVS forum just recently reviewed the Sony VPL VW885ES, which is a 4K laser projector that costs $25,000, and they paired it with this $9,000 lens, and they were able to measure that using the lens, they got 30% more brightness out of the projector due to the fact that they were able to use the projector's full panel resolution when watching 2.35 to 1 images. So if you are watching this and you do have the funds to spare and you want a no hold bars, no compromise, the best home theater you can get, then you can get a projector like that Sony or JVC even offers a projector that's a little bit better than the Sony and costs $35,000. And you can pair it with this anamorphic lens and you can eke the maximum resolution, the maximum brightness that your projector can provide. Now back here for the rest of us, this isn't really a very good option for us and zooming is good enough. Now there are some DIY solutions out there where you can buy prisms and make your own anamorphic lens, but the issue with doing this is it can cause some chromatic aberration on the edges of the image, which is color fringing, and also you lose a little bit of brightness if you're not using really good optical material. And so you don't really realize the gains that you would get if you got a lens that was specifically grounded and designed for this application. So now we come to the DIY projector screen. Now there's three options you can go with if you do a DIY projector screen. One is to get all the materials yourself, which is you build the frame, then you find a, a material to use as a screen material and you use that yourself. Another option is to buy actual screen material from a screen manufacturer, and some manufacturers will sell you raw screen material that you can put onto your own frame. And the third option is to paint your screen. Now obviously if you paint your screen, you're not gonna have an acoustically transparent screen because well, you know, it just doesn't work that way. So let's start with providing your own material. Now materials for a DIY screen range from like the uh, cheapest you can get, like you can get a uh, maybe a king size white bed sheet and just use something like that. Uh, something that's a little bit better but maybe a tiny bit harder to get is blackout cloth. Now blackout cloth is something you'd use for a screen that is not acoustically transparent. What blackout cloth is, is it's cloth that goes on the back of curtains so that you don't let light into the room. Well, this cloth is also a nice flat white cloth and you can use it for making a projector screen. The place you get this kind of cloth is usually Joanne Fabrics or Hancock Fabrics will carry blackout cloth somewhere in the store. Also, this cloth can be stretched just a little bit so that you can tension it really nice and get any wrinkles or anything like that out of the screen. Now, if you want an acoustically transparent screen, the best option I know of and the one that I've gone with is using a material called Milliskin Spandex. This material you can purchase from Spandex World, and currently as of the making of this video, it's about $9 per yard. Now when you use this material, because the Spandex is thin, you'll want to use at least two layers so that you don't have Im the image bleeding through and possibly causing a situation where you can see something behind your screen. So what I did was I got a gray material and I put it behind the white material and it's basically sandwiched together like that. You can also get a black material if you want a little bit more, if you want maybe a tiny bit of a deeper black level, or you can use two layers of white if you want to go that route. But the spandex has been measured by people on the AVS form to perform almost as well as commercial acoustically transparent solutions. Plus with how cheap it is compared to commercially available screens, it's really hard to go wrong with a spandex screen.
Another advantage of the spandex screen is that it's cheap. It costs twenty-seven dollars in material for the actual facing material that's gonna that you're gonna be looking at that creates your screen. So if you do have small children and one of them happens to take a sharpie to your theater screen, you're only out twenty-seven dollars as opposed to to if you buy a Stuart Film screen to Studio Tech one thirty screen which in that case you'd be out $3,000 if your kid draws on your screen with a Sharpie. The spandex screen is a good choice if you have a room that is completely light controlled, you can paint the walls dark and everything. Even if you can't paint the walls dark, it's still gonna perform pretty well, but it's mainly gonna be for a room where you're not gonna have ambient light, light issues. Now, if you do have ambient light, then you may wanna look at one of the commercial solutions that has maybe a higher gain or has some ambient light rejecting properties. But again, those are gonna turn out to be a lot more expensive than your standard screen material. Also, you gotta consider if you put your screen in front of a window and you have a dog that turns out to have separation anxiety, then you might come home to a shredded screen. Fortunately, the screen didn't cost too much. Now, if you wanna paint your screen, there are formulations of paint that you can go with. ProjectorCentral.com a while ago figured out the ideal formulation for paint, and they actually measured it against the Stuart Film Screen Studio Tech 100 screen, and they got the performance to be pretty close to identical using a painted screen. Now, the disadvantages of painting, of painting a screen is you need to do it right, otherwise your screen's not gonna appear uniform. Uh, for best results, you need to use a paint sprayer, but if you use a paint sprayer, you need to know how to use a paint sprayer to get a nice uniform screen. What Projector Central did is they found that if you get a paint roller that has a really small nap, you can also get a screen that is fairly smooth and will disappear if you're sitting at regular viewing distances. Now also on the AVS Forum DIY screen section, there is a multitude of paint formulations that people have come up with for making your own painted DIY screen. So if you want to go that route, there's lots of options for you. Now I'll also mention for a fixed frame projector screen, you're going to want to uh, cover the actual frame with a certain type of material. The best material to do this with is uh, black velvet. What the velvet does is it absorbs light very well and it reflects very little light at all. So that way, if you have your projector image spilling over onto the border of the screen, which uh, I do because my projector is not perfectly aligned with the screen, so you might just have to zoom it out just a tad, just a little bit more in order to fill up the entire screen. So that's going to spill over onto the border. And so if you cover the border of a fixed frame with black velvet, that light's not going to get reflected back and the picture is just going to disappear into the frame and it'll give you a nicely framed picture that'll look very aesthetically pleasing. Now DIY screens are generally going to be a fixed frame screen where you build a wood frame yourself and the aspect that you want and you hang it up and that's pretty much your screen. Now commercial screens also have various different options. You can have your standard uh, roll down screens where you have to grab it and you roll it down. There's motorized screens where it does it automatically and then there's also screens that can be recessed in the ceiling where it'll drop the screen down. And the more you spend, then the quieter the motor is going to be. So if you want a screen that will drop down nice and quietly, you can get that. Now, if you do, now the advantage of a roll down screen is it can be rolled up so that it's unobtrusive when you're not using your screen. So maybe if you're in a situation where you have to use your living room for your home theater, but you don't want to have the screen there taking up all that space, well, and you can get a screen that retracts. Now one possible issue with the retracting screen is that if it is not perfectly flat, there's going to be a little bit of waves on the screen, which isn't going to be a problem when you're viewing an image which is still. But if you have an image that is panning across the screen, those waves are going to show up and you're going to see that the screen is not flat. Now to solve this problem, screen manufacturers also make what's called tension screens, which is screens that have a wire that holds the screens out so it keeps them as flat as possible to minimize this issue from happening. But of course, that's also going to add to the price of the screen. Now for commercial screens, they start around as low as a few hundred dollars, but then they go up fairly quickly for the really nice screens, easily into the multi-thousands of dollars. Probably one of the most well-known and well-respected screen manufacturers is Stuart Film Screen. Uh, two of their most popular screens is the Studio Tech 100, which is a neutral gain screen. And then they also have the Studio Tech 130 screen, which has a gain of 1.3. Now these screens are actually used in a lot of commercial mastering studios, so 
These are screens that, uh, if you have the screen, the movie you're watching may have actually been mastered on a Studio Tech screen. Now there are some other high-end screen manufacturers that also other movie studios that use, they don't exclusively use the Stuart screens, but they're uh, one of the most well-knowns. There's also many others, there's uh, Daylight, Elite, uh, Seymour AV, all in, all in different uh, price categories, and there's a lot of research you can do, but what this video, what the aim of this video was, was to kind of give you an idea of what the specifications are, give you some things to think about the tools that you need to better make a good decision on what kind of screen that you're going to want to get for your home theater. Now again, some resources that I've used. I mentioned in my last video, projectorcentral.com is a good resource. They also have some articles on screens. They have the article on their DIY paint formulation that you can use. And another good resource that I've used a lot is the AVS forum. And they have a whole section dedicated to screens and they also have a section dedicated to DIY screens along with all other things that have to do with home theater and home video and home audio and all that stuff. Really excellent resource, lots of information overload. So there's a video on projector screens. If you have any specific questions for me, go ahead and ask them in the comments below. I'd be happy to answer them for you or at least try to answer them or guide you in the right direction. So in the coming weeks, I'm going to be posting uh, another video on this. It's probably going to be about home theater audio, but we'll see if there's something else I think might make better sense. But if this video was helpful for you, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe if you want to see more. And hope you found this educational and thank you for watching.